save this one uh, because Mike is going to give us a little walking tour of the Thursday, um, which is exciting. Hey, Mike, how you doing, bud? Oh, can't hear you. Um, hey, oh. Chris, can you hear me? I can now. Yeah. Hey, how are you? Ah, I'm okay. I'm okay. Um, yeah, just a moment. I actually was finalizing, setting up everything. But yeah, I'm okay. Um, Thanks for making it on such short notice. And I'm sorry I gave you the wrong day. Jesus, I don't know where that came from. Too many things I'm doing, but uh, I appreciate you being available right now as I had planned, but didn't tell you. So um, it's perfect. Okay. Let me just quickly ping. I know um, Ling always has to join about 15 minutes late because she has a, uh, uh, it's very early Pacific time. Um, but let me just see if uh, Dahl and uh, David is on uh, vacation, but let me just see if Dahl is joining and then we can go ahead and get started. All right, let me see here. Okay. Well, while we do that, why don't we do uh, a couple of intros here uh, for those of you who don't know each other. Uh, yeah, Chris Donnelly, you want to just introduce yourself and tell a little bit about what you're doing? Sure, yeah. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Obviously, my name is Chris Donnelly. Yet another Chris inside yeah. Open Air. Um, I've been helping, I've been working with Chris Kashud on uh, the Carbon Crowd um, web application platform. Uh, so we've been kind of figuring out, you know, how the whole thing sits together. I've been doing the design side. Kashud has been doing the engineering piece on it. Um, yeah, so I've been working for the past kind of almost a year or something at this point, is it? Amazing. Yeah, yeah, it's been a good yeah. while. Um. Yeah, so I, I pity I can't make these calls on a regular basis, uh, just with work and all that. But I'm happy to be here today because I'm very, very excited to see how Thursday is going to be going. So this is kind of cool. So nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, and Chris is based right outside of Dublin. And uh, he's also was the designer of our very popular I open air sign basalt T-shirt. If you haven't seen that, if you go to our website on the merch page, you can see that. Uh, I have two, two of them. Uh, for a while, it was our top seller. So uh a man of many talents so uh great i'll go over to seth uh hey guys i'm seth sternberg i'm pretty new to carbon crowd and open air overall uh just trying to get my feet wet and learn as much as i can and help out however i can and your background is in uh i am in product management uh working with uh sensors and Im embedded code great and you're in dc great and uh nam Hey, uh, everyone. Uh, my name is Nam. I just joined uh, Open Air two weeks ago, I think. Uh, and I'm still trying to figure out what I, how I can contribute to the collective. I had some interesting exchanges uh, about something, an article I found um, about uh, pH swing to uh, remove CO2, CO2 from seawater. So I have some... Uh, we're trying to see if we can make an experiment sometimes. Yeah, I know you talked with Alex uh, on the air synth yeah. thing, and we talked about that on Friday. So that was uh, cool news. And you're an aerospace engineer and you're based in Northern Jersey, right? Yes, correct. Yes, I'm a, an aerospace engineer uh, trying to pivot to uh, climate. And yes, I'm based close to New York. Awesome, cool. And correct. I'm going to keep Mike last because he's going to get right into it. He's the man of the hour. Uh, and Jacob, yeah, if you want to just quickly introduce yourself. Yeah, hey, everybody. Um, so I'm Jake. Uh, I'm in L.A. Uh, my background is in finance and data science. And I actually just uh, finished uh, Terra.do's fellowship program, which I definitely suggest if anyone's interested. Um, and yeah, just fairly new to open air. Talked to Chris about getting involved with this project a couple weeks ago and decided to learn more. And Nam is a Teradu alum as well, right? Yes, I was part of the Xerus cohort, so I finished a month ago. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you were the one right before me then. Yeah. Oh, I was. I was the Yas yes cohort. Okay. Great. Right, cool. Well, we'll probably have a, a few other people jump on. Certainly, Doll is going to jump on because she's got a thing she's working on that is uh, relevant to this on the documentation side. And then Ling, as I said, always joins usually about ten to fifteen minutes late. But we can go ahead and get started. And uh, Ling has met you, Mike, before. But Mike, yeah, if you could introduce yourself. So I'll, I'll, let me just set this up a little bit. So Mike and his partner, uh, Duncan, 
uh, who now are the engineers for Octavia Carbon, part of the founding team, the first sub-Saharan DAC uh, company, you know, sub-Saharan African company. And um, they, in the later part of their school, joined open air, were interested in doing a, a project around direct air capture. And then once they joined Octavia, uh, they just decided to build one. Uh, and I was kind of like, oh, that's interesting. And then when they showed it to me, I was like, holy Jesus, because within open air, we're, we're, we're constantly trying to build these different things. There's been a couple of different ones that I was just like blew my mind. And and then we we managed to get uh, Duncan and, and Martin, who's the other, the CEO and founder of the company to come to COP uh, 27 in Egypt, where I met them. And they gave a lot of amazing presentations and are really taken off as a company. And they were willing to uh, open source Thursday for us because they moved on to a new design. So the the more than a kernel that we have to start uh, Carbon Crowd with is this awesome DAC machine that uh, Mike Duncan and the team uh, built in their their house in their office uh, last year. So with that, Mike, uh, I'll hand it over to you and please uh, fill out your bio if there's anything I left out. Um. Okay. Um. Hey guys, can you hear me? Yep. Uh, cool. Um, yeah, I'm doing this on my phone. Yeah, anyway, um, yeah, my name is Mike Pondera, as um, Chris has introduced me, and um, I'm the research and development lead here at Octavia Carbon. Yeah, my background is in um, mechanical engineering. Um, just finished and just graduated last year. And yeah, and ever since I've been working with Octavia Carbon, and yeah, I think what we've been doing basically is just um, trying to prove that um Kenya is Kenya is the Kenya is the place to actually economically scale dark and so that's what we've actually been putting all our all our efforts on and yeah really excited about um what's to come and also just like to show much appreciation to um the open air collective in general we also had um, um tons of help in, just in terms of coming up with the um, you know, the design of Thursday. And yeah, I think that's it for me. Well, it's been one of my greatest joys, uh, Mike, is watching you guys do your thing and have any kind of support role in it. It's just been fascinating to watch. And for those of you who don't know about it yet, yeah, you will soon, but Kenya is looking to make a major play in direct air capture. They have an enormous amounts of geothermal uh, and basalt storage possibility. So some of our members were at a meeting with the president's office uh, and other stakeholders a couple of weeks ago in Nairobi to sort of plan that out for a big announcement in September. So keep your eyes on on Kenya and companies like uh, like Octavia. Um, I see that Ling just jumped on too. Hey, Ling. So we're just going to go ahead and, and do a little walkthrough. We got Mike, uh, a phone, and the Thursday there. So this is our opportunity to kind of pop the hood a little bit and ask some questions. Mike, as you heard, but maybe as you jumped in, you got a bunch of technical people, engineering people here, uh, with the exception of myself and Donnelly. Um, and Jake, I don't know if I can't remember if you have enough to be dangerous in that realm, but uh, you might be on on our side too. But let's go ahead and get into it. And uh, yeah, Mike, do we want to just kind of get closer to the unit and maybe we can just sort of rip questions out as we go? Or what's what's most useful for you guys in terms of, you want just a quick kind of walking tour of the full thing first, and then we can get into questions? Give me a thumbs up if that ladder sounds good. All right. I see one. Okay, let's do that. Does that sound good, Mike? Yep, that sounds good. Perfect. Yep. So um <laughs> this is Thursday. I've actually just um disassembled it. Um sorry for the mess. There's some tools all over the place. But yeah, um I think well, most of you might have um, had an idea of how Thursday generally is. So there's this um, transition that as you can see, it's just kind of dismantled. And this is our southern chamber. So um, briefly, I'll just take you through um, the components of Thursday, like um, these two black components you can see at either end of the machine are the fans that we use to blow air through the, um, through the solvent. And next to the fans are just some um, dampers, yeah. The, butterfly valves that would help us control airflow um, through the system. And below here is, um, it's just a low pressure buffer tank that we do to actually hold the CO2 that we've dissolved for um, a moment to actually, you know, stabilize, stabilize the flow rates that um, 
as we basically be compressing the CO2, um, you know, to a high pressure tank or, or sorts. So um, I, I pardon my ignorance, but I'd assume that most of, most of you to some high level at least um, have seen Thursday and you know, know how um, the design of the machine is. And today we actually would want to see how we did the sorbent chamber, which is what we hadn't shown you yet. And so just quickly, this is our sorbent chamber. And uh, yeah, so as you can see, it kind of has a quite the large surface area for uh, definitely for, um, you know, increasing the surface area of contact for um, absorption of the CO2. And we tried to make it as thin as possible, but well, this, wasn't the th this isn't the thinnest we could get to. Well, uh, um, but yeah, at the moment, this is what we tried. And so basically it's, it's um, if I just kind of try to open it up and you can see inside, and we, we removed most of the solvent from inside as you're doing some tests. And please feel free to actually stop me if there's something I'm talking about and um, you know, it's not that comprehensible. Yeah, anyway, so this is basically where the solvent, the powder itself lies. And as you can see, um, these strands that are actually, you know, crisscrossing, zigzagging all along this chamber are um, nichrome wires um, lagged with clay. So as you can see, if I move quite closely, you can see just at the broken section, I try to focus it, you could be able to see like um, some thin wire within this um, brown clay um, lagging. And so um, we use temperature um, swing adsorption for um, our solvent. And so we needed a solution for heating the solvent. And so one of the major things we were thinking about was cost. How can we do it cost effectively? And so this is what we came up with. We came up with, um, you know, having nichrome, a nichrome wire that we could wound um, all along the solvent chamber and then coating it with clay to actually help in terms of number one, um, um, that clay is quite the good insulator. So it actually helped because the nichrome wire tends to get really, really hot and really high temperatures would actually degrade the solvent. So clay would um, insulate the, the, the solvent from most of the heat and also clay would actually retain a lot of the heat that we supply because we noticed that once you pass current through the nichrome wire and it heats up, as you stop supplying current, it kind of like goes back to room temperature more or less immediately. So clay was actually helpful in terms of just helping to retain some of the heat and kind of like help us uh, control our power consumptions for the heating. So um, yeah, so what we have here, what we basically, so we, we, we'd sandwich the solvent and the heating system in between um, these layers of, this is like um, an aluminum composite sheet that we, we had and we kind of had them laser, laser cut so that we could get some good amount of um, airflow through it. So what this aluminum composite basically does, it gives us a support because you know we're having the solvent and we have to support the solvent, but at the same time, we have to allow airflow to pass through. And so our initial design for Thursday, um, which we actually used like a nylon filter, a porous nylon filter was actually able to, um, as you can see, I'm just kind of pinching on it right here. So this is a porous nylon filter that, you know, is um, allows air to pass through, but doesn't allow the solvent to um, spill out. So that was one of the major considerations. And this aluminum composite, together with this um, blue, blue um, kind of mesh, were just extra support for the whole system. Because as you can see, if I just try to, um, sandwich the solvent with only the nylon filter itself, there won't be enough rigidity. So uh, yeah, more or less the, 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 sorry, the aluminum sheet was just mainly for rigidity. And the inner sheet, as you can see here, it's, it's an insulator um, 
for electricity. So what, what we used it for was to kind of reduce, it was mainly a safety factor to kind of reduce um, the, the, the chance of shorting. Because one of the major challenges we were having in Thursday was, yeah, we had this um, clay, nichrome wire lagged with clay. And clay, as it dries, it turns up to crack. And once it cracks, it, 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 um, it exposes the nichrome wire to the solvent. And once the solvent kind of touches the nichrome wire and charring kundaka and stuff. So just as, a, as an extra safety issue, I guess we kind of decided to have this blue, um, this blue mesh which is um, electrically insulating to avoid shorting. Well, at least with the outer side, like the aluminum composite sheet and, 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 and such. So just a few pointers, like I said, this wasn't the best um, design we could do for um, the heating system. And we actually noticed them way better, way more safe, way safer uh, ways of you know, doing the same electrical resistive heating, whereby um, I think you could you could even find like um, off the shelf solutions like silicon, um, silicon like silicon kind of the, the, this. Should I call them like conductive ropes? Let me say that you could find off the shelf. I, I can actually confirm what they're actually called, and they the, they could be a good alternative for this. Um, solution that we had here whereby um, it's lagged the, the 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 conducting wires are actually lagged properly way more professionally than what we did here um, but anyway this is generally it and so there was this um, wooden frame that we actually used to kind of have it snug inside this um, transition of ours because this is the, trans the transitions that would sit on top of the on top of the low pressure buffer tank here. So the wooden frame was actually just enabling the, the solvent chamber to fit snugly onto the transition. And yeah, I think we also kind of wired some temperature probes inside, mainly for the controls. I think um, yeah, we, we kind of connected things very tightly over here. Um, so uh, if you could see a bit, you could actually see some of the solvents that we didn't check out. And yeah, so the probes are also kind of inside there. And yeah, generally that's it for the solvent chamber. And before I continue, any questions or anything that wasn't clear that I could confirm? Um, yeah, I have a question. Um... Uh, what did you say? I didn't catch it. What did you say happens when the um, nichrome wires touch the sorbent? Oh, okay. So uh, to provide more context to that, the sorbent, we found out that um, at temperatures above 100 degrees thereabouts, especially once you have like, there's a high concentration of oxygen around, the sorbent would tend to char. And the problem, the, sorry, the problem with the nichrome wire is unless you kind of regulate the, the power you supply to it, it kind of gets really hot, really quickly. Mm -hmm. Like if you just um, apply like to, well, for, 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 for Kenya, the, the main voltage is like to 40 volts. So if you actually just apply to 40 volts to it without regulating, it could get to as hot as 220 degrees. And so wow. you can imagine this exposed wire touching your solvent, which could start charring at around 100 degrees. So that could actually trigger the charring of the solvent. And once this solvent starts charring, it easily spreads out towards most of the other solvent. So yeah, that was the main issue with having exposed nichrome wire. Okay, cool. And then another question is, um, um, I remember a, a problem about sorbent sagging was was mentioned. So do you experience that like the sorbent is at the bottom, maybe like two thirds or four fifths of the um, the sorbent panel? And then and then how do you detect that the air is like flowing too much through, through the top and, and not like actually through the sorbent because it's less resistance where there's less sorbent? 
Oh, yeah. So um, just quickly to point out, um, yeah, the aluminum sheets, yeah, sorbent um, sagging was actually a major issue that um, we were having. And initially, we hadn't even incorporated these aluminum sheets. Well, I think we had them, but they were on the inside rather than the outside. And so we noticed that actually having this aluminum sheet on the outside and kind of ensuring it's compressed really tightly. And we use this, um, this bolt you can see um, at, the, at the edges. We use them to actually fit the aluminum, the aluminum frame tightly, sandwiching the solvent tightly and ensuring that it doesn't really have room to actually settle at the bottom. And yeah, having, you know, you actually need to properly fill the solvent chamber with solvent because, you know, like if it was half full, air would actually prefer no, going no. through the path of less resistance, definitely. So one of the, I mean, it was still an issue, we couldn't really fill it to 100%, but we still were able to um, get some absorption from it. But yeah, trying to actually ensure that we've spread the solvent um, fully throughout the surface. And another thing was actually trying to make, to make the layers sandwich in the solvent as small as possible so that we can actually ensure the solvent is kind of like packed to the top was what we tried to do. Yeah, mm -hmm. but I mean, yeah, definitely having it two thirds full or so isn't, isn't the best because air would tend to flow through the, the path of less resistance. Um, can you explain the aluminum foil thing? Because I don't quite understand how you're incorporating it into the design. How do you press mm -hmm. against the sorbent for that? Ah, so um, you can see, so like I said, the, the main thing that the aluminum frame brought was rigidity. Oh, it oh, was actually okay. trying, yeah, trying to solve that issue of the sorbent sagging. And like you said, so you, you see this bolt would essentially like act as, you can see the bolts here, they'd essentially act as spacers. So the bolt passes through a nut that kind of comes from, is, is um, the nut like is at the other side of the chamber. Don't think you can see it properly, but anyway, there's a nut at the bottom side of the chamber. And so, you know, the bolt acts as a spacer. So the, the okay. more you tighten the bolt, the more the frame is pushed down. Yeah, yeah and also the way we kind of, um, should I say staple this nylon mesh together, we actually ensure there was a tight fit so that the more we compress this, um, the more we compress this, okay. this so aluminum by, layer, the more, yeah, okay. the so more by we aluminum control mean our like the frame, you know, mean like, exactly. it's like a piece yeah. of aluminum foil, so it's confusing. Oh, there's a piece of, oh, sorry, sorry. We actually used, funny enough, what happened is this piece of aluminum foil you can see here, there was one time we were actually testing the, the machine and we actually had this issue of solvent charging and it kind of burnt a bit through the nylon, the, the nylon, um, the nylon mesh. And so we actually just covered it up with some aluminum tape. But the aluminum I'm talking about majorly is this frame, aluminum yeah. composite frame. It's actually like a solid metal frame. Can I just ask you a question that Bernard quickly asked just for clarification? What look like sticks that you have in the middle are almost like just spacers. Is that right? I think that's the tubes that Bernard referred to in the chat. He said, what are the tubes in the middle of the filter? Uh, these ones or by the tubes, you mean this? Is that what you mean, uh, Bernard? You get to click the yes. And the, I think those are the only tube like things, I think. So I'm, I'm guessing that's probably it. Oh, yeah. So, um, yeah, so what this is, is essentially, um, this is the necrom wire, but it's lugged with clay. Uh, okay. Yeah, yeah, so it's just like thin necrom wires, but lugged with clay. Gotcha. So this is essentially our heating element. Yeah, yeah. Yep. All okay. Right. Any other questions on that, Nam or Seth or Jake or anyone? Bernard? If anybody has any questions. And just uh, CO2 is a kind of like absorb on a, I don't know. 
air passes uh -huh. through it. How much CO2 does it absorb? Your connection's a little weak there, Chris. I think you said how much CO2 does it absorb uh, as it flows through yeah. in, in like a single cycle, I guess? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, so um, what we are designed for was around 1.5 balls of CO2 per kilogram of solvent. So that's like what, 66 grams of CO2 per kilogram of solvent. So inside here we had roughly um, we are designed for 10 kilograms of solvent that would actually be inside this chamber. And so, yeah, that would translate to around 660 grams per kilogram of solvent. And so a cycle, so we did, well, if it was running and continuously, we had targeted for something, we had designed for something about um, one, ton, one ton in a year. So that's roughly around 0 0.5 kilograms in a cycle. Was it, um, yeah, I think it should be actually don't have the figures right in my head at the moment, but it, it should be around half, half a kilogram per cycle or per day. Uh, I think I can co confirm with, with you on that later on. But I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, a cycle is a day, is it, Mike? Oh no, a cycle, a, a day would have like six cycles. So I actually have to confirm okay. the, the actual thing. Okay, cool, thanks. Anyone else? We can move on to, uh, Seth, go ahead. Yeah, Mike, so I know you're monitoring uh, temperature and the airflow. Uh, is there anything mm -hmm. else that you wanna measure and keep track of while this is running? Oh yeah. Um, Definitely CO2 concentration both um, upstream and downstream of the of the solvent chamber. So that mainly kind of helps helps us um, control the sequencing because as you know, like um, once the difference between the CO2 concentration upstream and downstream of the solvent chamber is quite insignificant, that would actually tell you that you know your your solvent is more or less um saturated with co2 and that's when you move to your desorption first um another thing um we 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 will try to incorporate into thursday that i'd even advise um anyone who's working on on you know especially kind of using the same solvents you're using was um trying to sense for ammonia because um at really high temperatures, there'll be a risk of ammonia um, forming. I think because PEI is an amine and um, not the best chem um, in chemistry, but yeah, there, there would be a risk of ammonia kind of forming at really high temperatures. So having ammonia sensors just somewhere next to the solvent chamber could also help in terms of just keeping track of the stability should i say the stability of the solvent yes so yeah and also oh, sorry and also um pressure sensors especially sensors that could go to um vacuums because um once you dissolve you generally want to evacuate the you generally want to evacuate this plenum and we all know like um having vacuums helps in desorption and also and also helps in kind of um maintaining the purity of your CO2 once you dissolve. And so having temperature sensors, let me see if we actually still have them. So we, oops, I think we actually removed them. So we had some pressure sensors that were actually in this small little hatch over here that we actually used to monitor the, the pressure inside the, the transitions themselves. And that would actually help in telling us um, you know the evacuation pressures we need to get to once we once it was starting to dissolve. Um, hope that answers your question. All right, looks like it does. Great. All right, uh, shall we move on to the next component? Ling, did you have any other yeah, questions yeah. on that? Pardon? I just want to make sure Ling is. Uh, who's been you know, focused on this for a long time. Any, any other questions related to that that we would wanna get into? Um, sorry, did you talk about um, 
how how the carbon is collected um or like maybe i didn't understand it very well technically can you explain as if to a five-year-old how okay, okay. To collect the yeah. carbon yeah so yeah so once we finish our absorption cycle and that will take roughly three hours or so and now we want to go to the desorption cycle so we'd first evacuate um we'd first evacuate this um the transitions so we'd first evacuate these transitions and we do have some um, ports as you can see that are welded onto this um, transition as you can see from the bottom here and that's essentially where we connect a vacuum pump okay and so this vacuum pump after evacuating the system would then um, now um, after the evacuation would now heat up the solvent we now pass current through the nitrum wire that's within the solvent and the nitrum wire we kind of try to wind it so, such that most of it would be in contact with the solvent because the solvent is a poor conductor of heat so once the nitrum wire heats up it heats up the, the clay that's surrounding it this would actually heat up um, start heating up the solvent and that's when now the co2 would start dissolving from within the solvent and we'd actually, as it dissolves and, you know, its partial pressure increases, it also increases the total pressure inside the, well, it also generally, it also increases the pressure inside the transition itself. And now that's when we could now kind of tell that we have some CO2 that's dissolving inside this plenum. So we'd also still use that same vacuum pump as some sort of air transfer component to transfer this CO2 from the transition into this um, low pressure buffer tank. So as you can see here, there's also an, an inlet port. So we now transfer that CO2 into this um, low pressure buffer tank. And from there is when now we could now even, you know, compress it into like a high pressure air receiver. So it's connected via a tubing of some sort, I'm guessing. Exactly, yeah, yeah. So okay. from tubing into a vacuum pump, then from the vacuum pump into here. Okay. I don't understand. Um, well, I don't really know that much about like pressure um, buffer tanks or pressure tanks. Um, uh -huh. um, how are, like, is it stored in like gas form or liquid form or uh, low pressure? Um, so it's uh, okay. stored so, in gas form, right? Yeah, it's it's definitely stored in gas form. And um, you know, you could essentially kind of like um so you know, like some air, let me show you like um some you can see the small red tanks mm -hmm. just right in front. So those would be like an example of you know your 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 air receiver, it's like a high pressure tank. And okay. you know, generally speaking, you could compress straight from this plenum into those tanks but you know with compression you want your compressor to kind of have um consistent flow rates and so that's what this tank was for it was just a buffer tank to kind of hold this co2 at should i say atmospheric levels to kind of ensure that we have whenever now we want to compress co2 to these high pressure tanks we have a good buffer of this to actually so that it doesn't really affect the compressor. And that was the main thing. Um, that was the main purpose um, for this tank, it's like a low pressure buffer tank. Okay. Um, would you say that fully extracting the carbon that you collected is still a challenge because it, it's hard to like, you know, completely separate the carbon from other gases? Yeah, um, exactly. Like especially um, for 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 our initial design, um, evacuating the air to like um, near should I say near perfect vacuums is you know it's quite the challenge because you have to ensure there are no leakages into your into your system mm -hmm. that you have a strong enough vacuum pump that can evacuate most of the air before you actually dissolve CO two into that. So yeah, CO2 mixing with air that's inside um, the transition is actually a really, really um, 
huge problem and yeah that, that's one of the things for we actually were considering for our subsequent um, designs on how to just improve the purity from this machine and i could go deep on how you could um, you know and, and you know plug in like a co2 liquefaction and purification system to just enhance your purity but yeah I kind of try to get really strong well really good vacuums inside um inside that um transition is really really play the key part to the you know to the purity of co2 that you're getting yeah it's probably expensive um okay i don't want to hold up the meeting but um thank you for answering my question um it's really great to see uh your space also <laughs> so big um yeah yeah <laughs> And um, we actually moved in um oh, sorry yeah sorry go ahead oh uh, same we actually moved in at the start of the year okay. from a really small from a really small office so and that was significant nice um so i just want to mention that i was going through um the thursday stuff on discord on thursday or friday last week and i noticed mm -hmm. that sometimes there's like new stuff that i don't notice because it's in like three places it's more meant for like everybody in, um and also chris um and so i'm planning i haven't got the chance the chance yet but i'm planning to kind of like make a document that gathers all the stuff and then maybe like people can add to it because right now it's like spread in three different places carbon crowd thursday channel and thursday forums <laughs> it's everywhere um yeah so i'm gonna work on that in the near future great uh, awesome um guys anybody else have questions on that part we can also have mike show us one thing i'll say if you haven't looked at it yet in the hackster page that i shared there's also mike does a of the thing fully assembled he does a little three minute walkthrough and shows it turn on and off and then he also has we have a 45 minute webinar hour-long webinar that we did in November of him really talking through the full system. So those are those are good resources to take a look at if you haven't already. But Mike, if you have time, is there any chance you could just kind of give us a close up of the other parts that are disassembled and then take questions if they arise? Um, okay, so um, yeah, so this is the other, the disassembled machine. And like I said earlier, um, basically, you know, what the machine does, is, it's just like a hatchback machine, kind of just tries to, you know, you build your machine to actually get the best out of your solvent. So like we said, you know, um, one of the major factors is for actually capturing CO2 is being able to blow large flow rates of air through your solvent. And this is where these funds come in. So first of all, we actually um, had this, so as you can see, um, sorry, I think my lighting is a bit bad, but um, I hope you can be able to see them. The two fans at the end. So basically what would happen from the arrows, air would come in from this side, flowing that way, as you can just tell from the arrows. And the reason we had two fans was <clears throat> mainly to actually try to, you know, having two fans in series, tries to um, resist the pressure drop that occurs when you have you know this packed layer of solvent that's restricting airflow because you know it's kind of packed and and you know in quite a significant you know thickness and so the the two funds we actually were able to get um i mean in general um we can well don't know how many had a background in mechanical engineering, but these are centrifugal funds, like inline centrifugal funds. And that's opposed to the normal actual funds you'd see, which just um, actual funds like the, the one you can see on top there. And the biggest consideration was pressure drop. So these funds are, are able to create that strong force of not only like blow large volumes of air, but also ensure this air has like the strong force to be able to force it its way through the through the solvent, through the solvent layer. 
And yeah, um, the next one, these um, valves and these are just um, like I was telling you, this uh, our, our dampers and then just um, like butterfly valves. Let me actually go this side, I think you'll be able to see it. And just give me a moment, I think I can, I can put on my flashlights so that you can be able to see things more clearly. Just a moment. Well, I think I, I can't really turn it on right now, but I think you can work with what you have. Yeah, so inside here, if you could be able to, sorry, let me try to adjust the phone. There's a plate inside. There's a plate inside here. And this plate is actually moved by this kind of, there's a small actuator that's connect, that has a shaft connected to that plate. And so once you, you know, you can open and close, you can move that plate so that's like generally opening or closing a channel for the air. So right now I have closed the channel and you can see air is blocked. And once I move it, it opens up for airflow. So basically this is what the dampers will be doing. They just kind of control airflow. So you open it up once you want to absorb and once you want to dissolve, you close it up. So one of the biggest considerations for your dampers is they should be able to, they, they should be airtight. And yeah, we basically had um, dampers on both sides, on the inlet side, on the upstream side of the sorbent chamber, and on the downstream side of the sorbent chamber. Sorry, and just, to, yes. just to clarify, you said they should be or they should not be airtight? They should be airtight once you close them. Okay. Because okay. you know you don't want leakages into your system once you right. close the dampers for this option. Hmm. Yeah, and um, I think those are actually the major parts of the machine because they're the ones that actually control the airflow and all. And so now in the middle is where the, the sorbent chamber, chamber with the transitions will come in. And so, yeah, you'd actually connect the transitions to this um, to the two dampers. And yeah, I think I'd, I'd explained it earlier. Down here is the low pressure tank. We are now with con the connection from the, from the chamber to, through a vacuum pump onto um, the low pressure buffer tank. And yeah, that's majorly the, the, the design of the machine. It's nothing really that complicated. So what's left is actually now all the you know controls and all that so you design your control system and the electronics that come with it the the sensors that i talked about earlier and all that but this is basically just the gist of the machine and um yeah i think i can also take questions if you have any yeah you were saying for the uh for the air tightness of the dampers, mm -hmm. that's also going to affect your ability to get a good vacuum, right? You're you're vacuuming all the way to the dampers, correct? Exactly, yeah. So um, one thing you could do, I mean, you could always, um, you know, order like such high vacuum dampers off the shelf, you know, the companies, that do provide such solutions. But if you wanted to essentially do it yourself, you'd have to ensure that um, as much as, you know, once you kind of close off your system, you actually have to ensure that you have gaskets all around the circumference of this, the plate that opens and closes to actually ensure it's airtight because you can't, you know, the, the, the body is metallic and the plate is also metallic. And so you can't really have that metal to metal. There'll be a, some sort of allowance for rotation because you don't want to have that metal to metal contact. So around the, the plate, you'd actually have to use gaskets to, to ensure that once it closes, it's, the plate closes, it's airtight. And when going going back a bit, when you were talking about um, getting the the CO two into the buffer tank, uh, mm -hmm. are you doing that actively, or are you just relying on the lower pressure to transfer that? 
Um, pardon, could you could you repeat the question? When, when you when you've done the the desorption and you're getting the CO two into the buffer tank, mm -hmm. are you actively pumping that in, or are you just relying on the lower pressure to do it? Oh yeah, we're actively pumping that in, and so that's what I'm saying. It's like kind of the versatility of the vacuum pumping that as much as you can use it to evacuate air from the air from the um, transition, you can also use it um, as a gas transfer component because as much as it can draw a vacuum from one side from its inlet side, it can also withstand some pressure on its outlet side, not too much pressure like a compressor, but it also can withstand some pressure on its outlet side. So you can actually use it to just also transfer air from one point to another. Okay, very cool. It's getting a bit dark. I think if anyone still wants some um, visualization of the machine and actually have to walk and turn on the lights. But yeah, any more, any other questions? I can see it pretty well, actually. Um, but yeah, is anybody, uh, Nam, looks like you took your mic off or put it on. I, I have a bunch of questions, but you don't want to interrupt too much the flow. Uh, so when you pump or when uh, you transfer the air, uh, you, I mean, the CO2 from the uh, sorbent chamber to the buffer chamber, I think it's called the bottom. So you have a mix mm -hmm. of air and CO2 is just more concentrated, the CO2, this, is, is that what it is? Yeah, so you know what would happen? Initially, you definitely pump um, into, you definitely pump into, um, a mix of air, but what you could do since you have your closed system, you could also evacuate this low pressure buffer tank um, just before you pump in CO2. And so uh, uh, an important consideration if you want to kind of have this buffer tank is that number one, you know, the, the material that you use, you actually have to have like really thick sheets of, of metal that could withstand, you know, vacuum pressures. Another mm -hmm. thing you could do that you actually noticed was the plenum itself from how we designed it actually had quite the volume. And so the plenum itself could even act as, you know, a buffer storage for this CO2. Because, you know, once you dissolve into it, there's quite the volume that could buffer up some, you know, amount of CO2 that you could now directly pass through a compressor into a higher pressure tank. So um, for this design, you actually noticed the, the low pressure tank wouldn't be necessarily um, essential. Yeah, because the transitions were actually big enough to, to, to hold some, some levels of CO2. Okay, and so uh, once your mix of CO2 and air is in the low pressure chamber, what, what do you do with it? How often do you empty it and how do you empty it? Yeah, so um, yeah, like I said, what you want to do um, is to evacuate the, the low pressure buffer tank before now I'm dissolving, you know, pushing CO2 or transferring CO2 into it. Um, for, 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 for initial trials, since we actually didn't have much of a high pressure storage for CO2, we're actually just venting the mixture out um, to the atmosphere. But yeah, we, we, def we definitely worked on, you know, trying to evacuate this low pressure buffer tank, then pumping this CO2 into the buffer Hey, Mike, I think we just lost your sound. I don't know if anybody else can hear him. Um, can oh, we can hear you now. now. Yep, we can hear you now. Yeah. Oh, yeah, sorry. So I was, I was just saying um, that, yeah, we could, you know, after evacuating the pressure that's already inside the buffer tank, and now after you pumped in your CO2, we could now compress this CO2 into the um, high pressure tanks because, you know, at high pressure, you can store much, um, uh, 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 a high amount of CO2 in, a, in okay. a much smaller volume, yeah. Oh, it's okay. So there's a high pressure tank, so where you store 
the CO2 at the end. Okay, okay. Exactly. Um, so you mentioned you want to have uh, CO2 sensors uh, at the inlet and outlet. Do you know what type exactly. of sensor you want to use? Because I heard those type of sensors are fairly expensive, but I'm not so sure. Yeah, so um, for the sequencing, we actually went with the same sensors. I think um, most of the technical guys know it. It's called an SCD30 from, should it be Sensirion? Or um, you could also get one from, um, well, the, we, we got um, like a revised version of the sensor from a company called Seed Studio. And this, this, these sensors can get to 40,000 ppm of CO2. That's like, what, 4% of CO2 concentration. And that would be enough to actually control the sequencing, the sequencing of um, absorption and desorption. Because, you know, once you're absorbing, your CO2 would be, what, 400 ppm thereabouts. And the downstream would be, you know, significantly lower than that. So that range would be more than enough for this year, two sensors. But we actually found other sensors um, that you could still kind of hook up to a control system that you could use if you wanted to test out the purity of your CO2. And um, I think they're also from Sensirion and they're called, um, the, the code name is STC31. And these are sensors that can go all the way up to 100% of CO2, but granted the, the, the accuracy is a bit lower than the, 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 the ones which have a much smaller range. Okay. There's, a, there's a non-profit that is making a low cost uh, CO2 sensor. <clears throat> it's called Rebit. Uh, I call to the guy who I talked to the guy who created the nonprofit. You, you might take a look at what they do. Mm -hmm. But Ribbit, could you spell Ribbit to me? I think it's R R I B B I T. I let, let me double check. Okay. Yeah, we know this guy actually. He's a member of Open Air. Um, oh, he's a member also. I didn't know. <laughs> yeah, he's based in he's based in Seattle, I believe. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. What's his name again? Uh, Keen. Uh, yeah, Keenan. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah Keenan. Keenan. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's very close with Dahl, um, who unfortunately couldn't make uh, make the call today. But yeah, we do know him. Yeah. He's he's a mentor for uh, uh, Terra Dudu, so that's that's how I talk to him. Okay. Yeah, he's great. Ah, cool. Thanks for that. We'll connect you with him, Mike, if that's uh, of interest to you. Okay. Um, yeah, I would, I, would, I would appreciate that. I send the GitHub link, but um, I think they have a hackster page. They do have a hackster page. Uh, cool. Mike, I'm just sending the link to you on our, our Discord DM in case you're not able to grab links from Zoom on your phone. I just sent you the Rivet um, uh, Discord repo or uh, GitHub depot. Okay. okay, thank you. I'll, I'll look into that. Yeah, let me know because we we know the guy Keenan. So if if it looks like it's interesting, you want to talk to somebody, uh, I'll just connect you with him directly. It'd be totally into helping. Okay, appreciate Great. that. Well, cool. so we're getting close to the hour here. Uh, this was super illuminating. I think Ling will agree. Uh, just fantastic to see it. Um, any final thoughts from folks or from Mike? Also, like you know, we've talked about some of the things. I think for the first build, we're just going to try to recreate. What you can do what you've done and create fuller documentation, but it means we could also try to optimize in that first round as well. And there's plenty to do potentially with the sorbent uh, cartridge and some of the heating issues you're talking about. But if you had to pick one thing right now, I've asked you this many times, but given what we just discussed, is there something that you're most interested in seeing us focus on earliest? Um, I'd actually say the heating system, actually having a um, a heating system that um, number one is way safer than having, you know, lugging, trying to lug micro bars with clay, as you could see all the cracks around. Yeah, and also, you know, one that distributes heat more evenly. Because as you could see with clay and you, you kind of try to mold them with hand, 
you kind of have different thicknesses and different sections. And so you won't have uniform heat distribution. So if I had to choose one, um, I've gone to head if I actually just had to quickly choose one um, from the top of my head, I'd say just in making that, that heating system a bit, you know, improving it. Gotcha. I had a quick question too, Mike, is if, if you guys, do you think there's any opportunities for sh shrinking the footprint a little bit without sacrificing performance? Um, or do you think that that's kind of, you've hit a kind of a barrier there in terms of how big it is. It's not huge, but I'm just curious if you think you could do something smaller and still have the same effect with a different sorbent, you know, cartridge design. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, so one of the things we noted is, um, well, for at least our, um, how we pack the solvent, we noticed that we didn't necessarily need um, two, two funds. I think one fund would have been enough for you know, pushing air through the, the solvent itself. So, you know, having, you know, get rid of once like a fan would actually, you know, reduce the footprint. But another thing, as you can see, one of the major things that actually took too much space was the transitions because you have this, we have this situation where, whereby you have um, a small channel, like as you can see, the fan and the dampers, they're kind of like, you know, 10, around 10 inches in diameter. Then all of a sudden, you kind of transist into this bigger space and so the transitions themselves we, we kind of designed these transitions to just have a smooth transition of air into the solvent itself so um this um you know you'd have to do some um you know pressure drop analysis but this transition don't think it would be um imperative in your design, you could have a situation whereby you just have a quick transition from maybe the 10 inches to where now the solvent chamber itself was. And yeah, I think that's something you guys could work on. I'd say it's, it, it would still um, bend some analysis on pressure drops and stuff like that. But yeah, I think that Great. would also help. In, I'm guessing Nam, system. who's an aerospace engineer, might know a thing or two about pressure drop analysis, but uh, I, I don't know. I might be wrong on that, but uh, that, that's an interesting thing for us to look at. Um, so anyway, this was great, guys. We're at the hour. Mike, this was so helpful. I can't really uh, overstate that. So thanks for taking time out of your night to, to run us through this. And yeah, uh, really gonna, yeah, we'll keep proceeding here and uh, we'll let you know if we need any gaps filled. But uh, I think that just gave us a lot of information. Um, so Mike, the other thing that might help us a lot is that if you can take some pictures from your side, I took some screenshots if you don't mind, but um, I think um, just like some high quality pictures that people can see quickly without having to go through a video, that would also be really nice. Uh, mainly like inside the um, inside the sorbent panel and then, and then how it's, uh, the aluminum panel is uh, bolted to the wooden frame thing. Like that, that part was um, really helpful for me. Okay, uh, I'll work on the photos. Yeah, and Mike, you can just upload that to our WhatsApp or to Discord to make it easy for yourself just on the phone. Uh, don't, don't worry about, you know, killing yourself there as long as there's good light is really all we require, I think. Yeah, yeah Discord I think we yeah, I think we were having some issues with the lights of, of the warehouse, but I can actually just go and check it out. And if there are lights, I'm actually um, take the photos and send them. Okay, that's great. Awesome. Well, thanks, crew. We got a, we'll have Dal on next week. And uh, hopefully, uh, Ling, I heard back from the school in British Columbia. Uh, mm -hmm. One of the guys is interested, it sounds. So I'm going to see if we can get him to join the call next week as well. So. Okay, sounds good. Great. And I recorded this and I'll share the recording with the folks who joined here. Um, I see some folks join late, so we have this uh, on record. But Mike, thanks so much, man. Go get some sleep. <laughs> thanks, Mike. Yeah, okay. Uh, yeah. Thank, thank you. Thank you also. Thanks, and, Mike. Um, thank you. Yeah, we'll keep in touch. All right. Bye, guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.